Let's speak now to Amalek Shalabi. She's a media coordinator for the advocacy organization American Muslims for Palestine. She joins us from Seattle, Washington. Malak, thank you for your time. We know US President Joe Biden has spoken to both the Israeli and Palestinian leaders. Is it really, though, trying to frame itself as a mediator here, given its close ties to Israel? How effectual can it be? For context, we have to look at the United States relationship with Israel. And that, so far, has been an unconditional relationship of support. That means the United States is funneling $38 billion to the state of Israel to fund its military endeavors, its occupation, its live ethnic cleansing that is underway right now. This is the reality of the relationship between Joe Biden, um, his administration, America as a whole, and its legacy with Israel. What's important here, what's really, really important now, is that more Americans than ever are becoming aware of this. More Americans than ever are calling for justice and investment in the poverty, the other social justice crises we have domestically. And this money cannot be unconditionally funneled to Israel in pursuing their war crimes against Palestinians. Given that growing pressure that you mentioned there, what chance is there that the White House is going to change tact? Do you think that there will come a time when the White House does need to publicly denounce Israel's attacks on civilians? I mean, the way we understand how politics works is that our politicians, our representatives, recall, they respond to our calls. And the approach that many grassroots activists have taken, including my organization, American Muslims for Palestine, is we're working with members of Congress directly in lobbying and ensuring that the voices of their constituents are heard. And with that, with a growing group of voices vocal for Palestine in Congress, which we see now. There was the letter that Representative Rashida Tlaib wrote to the uh, State Department earlier in March, specifically on this issue, before it was viral, before it was a hot topic, calling what's happening in Palestine settler colonialism. There was also a letter from Senator Bernie Sanders regarding the COVID-19 vaccines to Palestinians in the occupied territories. There was legislation, absolutely historic, introduced by Betty McCollum very, very recently. And just now, last week, was the letter introduced by Representative Marie Newman on the impending home demolitions in Jerusalem. So this is what needs to continue to happen to pressure our politicians, our representatives, and you know, eventually in the grand scheme of things, the presidential administration into responding to what the Americans are calling for. Bearing that in mind, how close do you think uh, the international community is to being able to broker a ceasefire or a de-escalation in the situation currently? I think, you know, that's what everybody is seeing this to be calling for. But in that, it's really important to take a step back and look at the historical timeline of this. What have, you know, politicians' responses so cynically been over the decades of occupation and murder and massacre? It's been, let's bring people to the negotiation table. Let's set up ceasefires and ensure that lives aren't lost. The reality is, the root of the problem is the Israeli occupation. The root of the problem is the colonization of Palestine. The root of the problem is the reckless massacre and disregard for Palestinian life and community. And that's the reason why this is the bloodshed continues to occur. And un until we're able to address that root problem, there is no way that we'll be able to um, alleviate or prevent any harm occurring in Palestine now. So much work still left to be done, as you say. Malak Shalabi, thank you for joining us live there from Seattle, Washington.